I want them to just hug it out already. Wrecker runs up and he hugs both of them. I love that. I really that. love that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so good. everyone to Krypton 2 Alderaan. I am Joey, your Star Wars lover, and with me is Royish Good Looks. Hello, podcast. Hello, Joey. Hello. And we're the podcast that analyzes nerdy pop culture, but it's mostly Star Wars. And this episode, we will be talking about The Bad Batch Season 3, Episode 5, The Return. But the return to what? <laughs> From where? We'll get to that in a bit. But first, real quick, we are currently sitting at 411 subscribers. We are so close to 500 subscribers, which means that we will get to apply to be YouTube partners and start to earn on this channel. So please, right now, before we even get into anything else, hit subscribe real quick. It'll take you two seconds. So do it. Hit that button. Do it. Do you have anything to add? Do it. And also thanks <laughs> for subscribing. Yeah. And, also, and also thanks. And also thanks to everyone who has already. And we really appreciate you. And let's keep this train a moving. Right on to Barton 4. That's the name of that planet. See, we are real fans. Not Hoth. <laughs> no, another monoculture ice planet. Anyway, here we go. Punch it. Pew. Pew, pew. You know what's funny? The last couple of times we've talked about this show, we have talked about how it was entirely in darkness. And the first thing we get is Omega shielding her eyes from the light. We have all emerged from the darkness that has been this season up until this point. They're on beautiful Pabu, and the sun is shining, and everything is great. The birds are twittering. Those monkey things are having a blast. Everything's real good. Can we just stay here, do you think? No, because it wasn't <laughs> the return to Pabu. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would have been good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we don't even fly directly there. We just wake up and we're on Pabu, right? Yeah, which is really how I prefer it, right? There's <laughs> no risk. There's no like, oh, are we actually going to get there? We get there. The sun is shining. The birds are chirping. And everyone is happy that Omega's back. And I was just real excited to see this because we have brought it up quite a bit, right? Like the first few episodes were very dark and dreary and pretty intense. Like it was very thematically intense. And we start this episode kind of being the opposite of that, where we even get to spend some time on the beach a little bit, you know? We're playing target practice with fruit. Yeah, it was very nice, even though we're playing target practice and Crosshair's accuracy rate is only 53%. So... Bummer. But yeah, such a 180 change here right off the bat. Yeah, I don't remember exactly, but I, that must have been one of the first scenes in the first episode of Omega looking out, you know, her jail cell into like, you know, the abyss, you know, the darkness, the despair, you know, no hope. And she wakes up to the sun on her face, you know, holding her. She's got her doll Lula. back there, you know? Yeah. So that was nice. Finally, then we can have some levity, like you're saying. Pabu is beautiful. Although we were like kind of zoomed out. We weren't like in in the town immediately. So I was a little confused of like, are we just on a nice little, a different getaway planet? You know, unless they say in the subtitle somewhere, somebody mentions the planet, you, you don't always know where you are, but uh, they obviously yeah. connected that later. I would also love to shout out Hunter and Wrecker for being such awesome parental figures that Crosshair is out doing target practice, Hunter and Wrecker presumably making some plans for whatever next mission they're going to go on. And Omega just kind of strolls in. She's stretching and yawning like she slept in and they don't yeah. give her any, you know, guff for that. Maybe they're not necessarily retired and on vacation yet, but they're OK catching a breather for a minute, which I appreciated. I also like to sleep in and I also like when my parental figures don't give me crap about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially now at 30 something years old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I didn't even I like that didn't even click for me. She's obviously waking up late and, and everyone is kind of just like happy to let everyone else relax. And at that point, Wrecker does say like special delivery from Shep and Liana, which is when at least when it was clear to me that they were on Pabu. I don't know if the captions say it like beforehand, like birds chirping on Pabu or whatever. But um, Twittering. Twitter. Is Twittering, that what the Charlie. caption said? It, it sure did. Okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think it's called Xing now. <laughs> Thanks, Elon. Yeah, so very cool to see. You're right. It's very sweet. And and all of their interactions here are like, there's something just so tonally different about the way the characters are even interacting with each other. 
where like the last time we saw Hunter and Wrecker in this season, Hunter was just a mess. Didn't even want to wait for Echo and Rex to get there to go and do this reconnaissance mission or whatever on that other planet. And everything just seemed very uptight and depressing. And now everyone is, even though Omega's the one waking up late, everyone seems very relaxed and happy and relief. The, the relief. There's like, they're radiating relief, which like, again, for an animated show, we're really able to pick up on as the audience, which I think is just like a testament to the narrative, the visuals, and like the storytelling just making us feel that way. So good. So good. This is exactly what I wanted. And I love them and I love it. Continuing from there, we get to go to the beach. You know, I would have loved a beach episode, but we get to go to the beach for a little bit, which was also just great to see, right? It just felt so warm. Maybe it's because we have been deprived of this in this season so far. And maybe it's because I personally really miss the ocean and the beach, but it just felt so good to be there. And of course, Omega's going down to see Crosshair. Crosshair's not there when she wakes up, like you mentioned. She goes and talks to him and. Here's the thing. Here's when I first started to notice this. Omega domesticated and saved Batcher. And Batcher returned the favor. But Batcher is Crosshair's dog. I have lines of evidence for that throughout this episode. Well, Omega loves everybody. She would adopt any animal or any person. And the, the funny thing with Crosshair and Batcher is they're both kind of... I know we have a character named Hunter, but they're both hunters, right? Batcher was a hound that was supposed to like fend off the other things in the jungle on Tantus or whatever, right? And was held captive there and was like a tool for the Empire when it was no longer going to serve the purpose. When the the dog was injured, they were going to put it down. And that's exactly, maybe not exactly, but very similar to Crosshair's story of, hey, you're no longer used to us. You know, we're just going to do tests on you and then we'll dispose of you whenever. Yep. And we talked about this last episode, like the parallel storyline between Crosshair and Batcher inevitably leading up leading up to the clones escaping like the animals like they set the animals free it is making me think that like crosshair is going to get recaptured like we've kind of been like toying around with the idea of somebody getting recaptured in the last episode that we've seen that we saw batcher gets captured on lao and then they go and free all the animals to save batcher and i'm wondering because Crosshair and Batcher's storylines are paralleling so much if that's the way it's going to work with freeing the clones as well. Is Crosshair going to get recaptured by the Empire and used as bait, essentially, for, you know, Omega and the Bad Batch? Speculation! I hope not. I don't want to flip-flop. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps, Crosshair, and and get, get in the game, right? He's starting to, like, soften and turn around. Omega, like you said, she's infecting him. Like, Omega has this, like, deep, deep well of enthusiasm and positivity and, you know, Crosshair just does not have that. And I need him to siphon some of that away, you know, or siphon more of it away because I feel like he's he's still a little bit on the like, leave me behind. You shouldn't have come back for me. You know, he says mm-hmm. things kind of of that nature throughout the episode. And I don't want that to be the case. I don't want him to be captured and say, forget about me, you know, save yourself. Please don't do that to me. Can we have a little bit more beach time? Yep, more beach time. You know what I really like, though, is Crosshair's regrets. That he is admitting to having these regrets and having made mistakes and being maybe caring less about his future or his, you know, worth, especially to this group because of the choices that he's made, which just seems very real. And, you know, him and Hunter have a very wonderful moment at the end. We'll talk about it later. They have a wonderful moment at the end that shows both sides of this. But I kind of really like that he's still working through all of that and being like, well, if if push comes to shove, I can't even shoot anymore. I have regrets. I thought I was doing the right thing. Thought I was being a good soldier. But yeah, that he's still working through all of that. I really enjoy that just seems so like real to me. Boy, it's going back to another thing that I keep saying, which is that this show is super good at making me love characters that I didn't think I would love. I don't know how they do it. You know, I don't know how they do it. But someone in the writing room is like, we're going to turn people around on this character and it's working. But I really don't want him to get captured and then have to do a whole rigmarole. I think I'm with you on that where I want like a strategic decision to be made without like 
having to make it because someone gets captured and is being used as bait and that kind of tropey, more tropey stuff, I guess. Yeah, we've already treaded that ground, so we don't need to do it again. Yeah. Hold on. Rewind. We need to go back and talk more about Batcher <laughs> and Batcher being <laughs> Crosshair's dog and Batcher being Crosshair's emotional support animal and Batcher knowing that that's her role in this. I love that. I love their interactions, her and Crosshair's interactions throughout this entire episode is just so good, regardless of like the parallel storylines. Like she is right by his side the entire time, except when he's like having his moment with Mayday's helmets. I think that's another great hack to get you to sympathize with Crosshair because he seems like this cold-blooded killer. Here he is petting a little doggo. That's not what you would expect from the sniper of the group that just follows orders, right? I love that. He's petting the dog. The dog's licking his face. They're leading each other kind of throughout the episode at a couple different points in time. Yeah, they're a pair. I think that makes us feel for Crosshair a little bit more that you see he's a human being. We're seeing that throughout the episode. Of course, you get the scene with the helmets. I love that he set them all up. I was like, is he just going to look at them and like contemplate things? And that he took the moment to put them all back up. Oh, great. And then Hunter sees that out of the corner. So we got these wonderful moments of realizing that, oh, I've made these choices that I didn't actually want to make. And I'm with, I'm back with my batch. I've returned to the batch. These are the people I should have been caring about all the time. Well, you know, this dog, I should be caring about this dog, right? We saved this dog. They were going to kill this. He's not saying these things out loud, but we're seeing all that develop. And again, like you're mentioning at the very end of the episode, he finally kind of fesses up with Hunter about what's going on. He just has a hard time kind of communicating verbally. Yeah, that's definitely not his thing. And that's okay. But he's learning, like we're saying, like infected by Omega's optimism and, and goodness. But he's also like coming to terms with stuff. And there's also, like with those helmets, there are these moments of silence that to me is so much more immersive. Like you were saying before we started recording, when they're on the beach, it's kind of like silent. There's no music happening. And in those moments, it's so much more immersive to me. I'm just allowed to exist in that space without something needing to happen all the time. With the helmets, no one's talking. I, I don't think there's even any music. Maybe there's a little bit of music playing, but he's stacking the helmets and Hunter is watching from the shadows to be like, what the hell are you doing? But we have the time to spend in those moments, which is just so good, makes it so much more emotionally available of a scene. It ties it all in for me. So Wrecker has never been the mo most like emotionally mature, but there are also these moments of like, obviously Omega's impact on the batch as a whole. She's obviously changed Hunter so much. She's changing Crosshair. When Omega and Crosshair are on the beach and Hunter and Wrecker are up above watching, Hunter says, maybe it was a mistake to give Crosshair back his rifle. Wrecker says, well, Omega trusts him and that's good enough for me. And that means so much. It's also the last time Wrecker saw Crosshair, the end of season one. Crosshair was the most mean to Wrecker. They're going through the facility on Camino as it's sinking, and Crosshair says something like, something on your small mind, Wrecker. And at that moment, I was like, nobody's like standing up for Wrecker here. Stuff like that, where like Crosshair was very mean to Wrecker specifically, and obviously showing him that like he has no respect for him. But then Wrecker comes out, and Wrecker's the one who's like saved Crosshair's armor and says it felt wrong to get rid of it. And that is also like, man, my heart grew three sizes. That's pretty damn good. And just like the impact that Wrecker was a little bit more there already, but the impact that Omega has had on, on these people. Totally. That was another scene that Crosshair doesn't really respond to, but we see several shots of him looking at the box of his armor and back at everybody else there. He's thinking something. We don't get the words though. Yeah, any friend of Omega is a friend of mine. We said this last episode too, like they didn't have the conversation so we could have the dramatic ending last week. But they're having all these moments of like, of course, he's going to come back into the fold because because of this connection with Omega. And he's having a turn of character. And even though the last time they met each other, they were not on good terms. This episode did a really great job of putting everybody back on the same page. I don't know if that's why they've titled this one The Return. You know, if it's just the return of Crosshair to the Batch or the return of them going to not Hoff or what it is thematically why they chose that title. Maybe it's all of those things. 
But I kind of like that. Like this episode may or may not have been considered like a side quest the episode to some people, but this like bringing everybody back into the fold was one of my favorite parts about this episode that they had a mission, very simple mission, just to read the data on this pad. It just so happened that a convenient place to do that was a location where Crosshair had a major pivotal moment that directly ties into why he's even back with the batch right now. So that totally, totally works. And that we've got a MacGuffin of some giant worm monster that we have to battle against. And the team has to bring together all of their varying skills to finish the mission, which is like, that's the Bad Batch. They each have a special skill. It's the Justice League. It's the Avengers, whatever. You know, we're getting the band back together. They work best when they're a team. So on my second watch, on my rewatch of this episode, was when I, I started to think, man, I wonder if people are considering this a filler episode or a side quest episode, which I, in general, dislike the idea of that. It's not necessarily about the backdrop or like the mission at hand. It's about Crosshair's redemption. So this is Crosshair's redemption arc. It doesn't matter where they are or what they're doing. The point of it is that it is Crosshair's redemption. They could be anywhere. They could have gone to Hoth instead of Barton 4. Thematically, it makes sense. He knows of an outpost that is not well operated. There's limited people there. It turns out there's nobody there. But it makes sense that that is where they go because he knows that there won't be anyone else there. Well, and he he had to volunteer that information and then go back to, you know, imagine the PTSD yes. he's suffering to go back there. He's forced to face the decisions he made there. Yep, that's 100% it. And also... I think another thing about this redemption, we should all be considering the sacrifices that Crosshair is now making in order to go through this redemption. First off, in this episode, a lot of things we've already seen, including telling Omega to leave him behind. That in and of itself is one of those things, but they're sitting around the dinner table on Pabu, and he, he gives that information. He's like, I know a place we can go, knowing that it is, again, like you said, like traumatic, a traumatic experience for him. When we see him get off the ship when they land on Barton 4, he has his helmet on and he looks up and he sees the bird, which was like the birds were the last thing I think he saw in that episode, in the Outpost episode on that planet. So I would imagine that if we could see his face in that moment, it would be one of like trauma and his response to being back there. The levels of sacrifice that he's making to go through this redemption, to supply them with information. That in and of itself makes it such a worthy and worthwhile redemption story. I think for the characters in the show and for the audience. I think another thing that we get when we get to Barton 4, we start to get the dynamic between Crosshair and Hunter back. Echo picks this up. Echo picks up this idea a little bit later in the episode. In fact, at the end of the episode. But last episode, we were talking about like Omega and Crosshair's dynamic and how great that is and how much I love that. But we're starting to see it also become kind of a familial argumentative sibling dynamic between Hunter and Crosshair as well, with Omega being the older sibling throughout it. We have the moment before they leave Pabu with Crosshair telling Omega not to hold anything against Hunter because he's just trying to protect her. And Crosshair says something like, regardless of what's happened, you're still a kid. And she says, I'm older than you, little brother, which is also an amazing way for their dynamic to be evolving. Like it started off with, like we were saying, the optimist and the pessimist kind of butting heads and that being very fun. But now it's turned into this more loving and familial dynamic. The banter's more playful, a little bit like that. Crosshair and Hunter have their little like back and forth. And if you're scared, why don't you wait on the ship? And Echo has to break it up. Why don't you kill each other later? Yeah, yeah. But then Omega comes in and she says, I told you to talk to him, not argue with him. And Crosshair says, he started it. And Omega sighs and rolls her eyes while facing the camera. It was like a very, it was kind of a meta moment, but it was just so good. It's like the older sibling kind of trying to diffuse this tension and argument, which I also just really love and I think is a good sign of them working on bringing the Batch back together as a family. And I don't know if it happens here, but throughout several points throughout the episode, we do get little hints of the Bad Batch theme music, their theme starting to creep back up, which I think is also a response to that. Yeah, but nothing totally coming to fruition just yet. Mm -hmm. Still a little bit of tension there. Dude, so many scenes of Crosshair and Hunter 
facing each other, facing off, or facing away, not looking the same direction, or walking by each other and then giving each other the side eye, like throwing so much shade. And then there was another really interesting parallel moment right before they're attacked by the worm monster. They're facing off, they're having an argument. Crosshair's looking at his hand and it's shaking, and then he turns it into a fist. They have a little bit of a back and forth. And then all of a sudden you see Hunter's hand. We see Crosshair's right hand, and then we see Hunter's left hand. And Hunter does the same thing. He's got an open palm, and then he makes a fist. They're about to fight, and then that's when the monster interrupts them. I don't know what the symbolism is there, that Crosshair's got the ailment. I do like that kind of mirror imagery there. And as George Lucas said, it's like mirrors. Three different people came in to break up a fight between Hunter and Crosshair in this episode, one of whom was the worm. Yeah, so do they need to duke it out? I think the end when Crosshair saves Hunter is is the end of that. And Echo saying, see, I told you they'd work it out. I don't even see any blood this time, right? That to me says, yeah, they always fought. Even before Crosshair left, right? They just kind of butt heads sometimes. So all of that is to say, filler episode? No way. Should that be our... <laughs> <laughs> should that be a Krypton to Alderaan tagline? Filler episode? No way. And we cross our hands and stand back to back. Yes. Well, I respect th <laughs> that you're like, why would they do that? Whatever you said earlier in this episode, like they don't write an episode because they're like, we don't have anything good this week. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. not yeah. how it goes. It's all good. For me, it was hard to see Crosshair going back to this, even though like, man, I did not really like him. Obviously, he was trying to kill them for the past you know, especially in season one and then wasn't so great in season two. But it was really hard to see him go back to the outpost. The outpost was the episode that like, I think really started to change things. Not only was it hard to see him go back there, but then he finds their helmets and he finds Mayday's helmet. And Mayday's is the first one he picks up and puts back on the crates. And then to see Hunter, I was hoping there'd be something more in that scene where Hunter would be like, what's all this about? But, but Hunter's just kind of a grouch about it. But I really liked seeing that and seeing Hunter watching crosshair do that and how hard it was and then they go out into the to check the perimeter and they have their little fight where hunter pushes crosshair right and then the worm comes i am certainly like finding that i'm sympathizing with crosshair much more than i thought i would especially with returning to the outpost in this episode well i'm having a hard time putting myself in hunter's shoes i guess would be more of the case like you said hunter's a grouch and knowing what crosshair went through on that planet and to bring them back there. You keep putting off the conversation about this last scene, but when he finally divulges, like, what happened, and even Hunter is not super sympathetic even at the end of the episode, he should take a moment to be like, I don't know what you've been through, knowing that Crosshair's not giving the full story, because Hunter says that. You know, you're not telling us everything. Well, yeah, dude, because he's got PTSD. So be a little bit more generous to your brother here. He was just in prison on a remote planet, like where you were never going to see him again. So he's just lucky to be there at all with Omega, by the way. So it's like you're saying with Wrecker, like, get over this, dude. Like, obviously, he's not a perfect soul or whatever. Everybody's damaged in their own way. But he's got to respect that he's been through this journey. He doesn't know all the intricacies about it, but he's trickling out some of the information. He doesn't need to even know the specifics to understand, like, you're going through a tough time here, huh, bud? Yeah, I do think they get there at the end. That was my read of that, of the final scene. I really like Crosshair pushing back, though, when they do go out to, like, check the perimeter right before the worm gets here, and Crosshair being like, you're not mad at me. You're mad that you messed up, that you failed Omega, that you got Omega captured, that I helped her escape and you didn't. That's what you're mad at. I really like that back and forth. I don't necessarily think that that's true, I love this because, okay, you're, you're jogging my memory. When that happened, I forgot about this. I didn't have it in my notes, but you're right. When Crosshair's like, I think you're just jealous that Omega's my friend now. I, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. there might be something to that because that's, that's a more rational conclusion to like, Wrecker forgave him. Why can't you forgive him? We have the same mutual connection through Omega. And that's what we were saying last week on the pod. Like, how could you not be happy that he returned with Omega? I could see that being the case. Like, no, I'm her father. We were saying, like, is Crosshair going to be the reluctant father figure? That might be part of it. It's just pure human nature. I'm jealous that you're getting along with the dog in Omega. Yeah. And, you know, there's some, like, trauma between the two of them as well and everything that they've gone through in the war and after the war. And I think there's still a little bit of, like, them treating Omega like a kid. Crosshair even says it. 
all things considered, you're still a kid, right? And I think there is a bit of Hunter doing that. He's obviously very protective of Omega. I think he's also a little bit like you with thinking like, Omega trusts everyone. She doesn't care if she adopts this do- this like rabid dog or Crosshair or whoever else, right? Sid, wh- mm. whatever. She trusts everyone. So that might not be the most trustworthy trait. So Hunter is a little bit more like, reserved or not willing to do that. So he's still like holding back a little bit. I want them to just hug it out already. Wrecker runs up and he hugs both of them. I love that. I really love that. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So good. Yeah. So either way, I think that conflict in the yard was, I think he's giving it back to Hunter a little bit saying, listen, you're not mad at me. You're mad at yourself and the situation that happened. And I risked everything again, another sacrifice made by Crosshair, fueling this redemption, I risked everything to send you that message. And you squandered it. When really, I think in that moment for me, I was like, Crosshair, I'm more on Crosshair's side here than I am on Hunter's side. Even though Crosshair, for a whole season, did nothing but try to kill them. He was imprisoned, and he risked everything. Literally, like, he really did risk everything to send them that message. And that means everything. You could have ended his redemption arc with that. Mm. And I would have been like, that's a great redemption. Check. A plus. But we keep getting these. He keeps going with the sacrifices, fueling the redemption, which I love. We have another Jurassic Park moment. In the last episode, we had Jurassic Park 2 with them freeing all the dinosaurs. In this moment, we have Jurassic Park 1 with like, someone's got to go reset the fuse box. You got to prime the fuse box, right? And it's even the same like pumping mechanism for the fuse. The circuit breakers are in a totally different building for some reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like an arm, a clone arm did not fall (laughs) onto Wrecker as he was like turning the fuses back on or whatever. But man, it's so funny, like the Jurassic Park things that keep popping up throughout this. I really enjoyed that. Like the mechanism is almost exactly the same as it is in Jurassic Park. We also get Wrecker kind of in a very meta moment saying, why is there always a huge monster? (laughs) Which I think at some points is like what the rest of us are thinking, right? Well, they had the rumbling in the background and I was like, please just be an avalanche because no one's been there and you turned off the sonic device and maybe for some reason that disrupted the geology in the area. I would would buy into that totally. And then of course the monster shows up and it's like, ah, monster of the week. And immediately it's like the next scene they cut to Wrecker saying that so that yeah that like absolved it with the little fourth wall break there I love that and he's so like he's so exacerbated by it he's just so exhausted he's like why why does this keep happening to us and then when he gets to the door he's like I have to dig the door yeah out. yeah yeah <laughs> so good it's like where's Batcher this show did a really good job of like balancing everything the the comedic moments and the you know heavy moments even the monster thing was not a long part of the episode. There was maybe no. like five, six, seven minutes left. You know, it was very towards the end. It wasn't like they were yeah. fighting it the whole time, you know? Right. They're fighting each other right. for more right. of it. But also, I kind of dig the monster design. I really dig the design of that worm and the plates in the face and stuff. I don't know. I thought it was super cool. Ice Planet Worm. When they go back out to get the worm past the sensors, Batcher actually waits at the, the outpost, but Hunter and Crosshair go. But when Hunter falls through the ice and Crosshair yells Hunter, to me, there's a tone in his voice that's also very worried and stuff. So to me, that was the moment when I was like, okay, Crosshair's back. Crosshair is part of the Bad Batch family again. He's made his way back into the family. And this that was the moment that did it for me. The way that D. Bradley Baker says that line is just so... It's kind of heart-wrenching. I'll have to listen to it again. I don't recall the exact tone, but I'll buy into that. I, I liked in that moment that he's like, you know, we'll we'll track you. Oh, great. You know, you're looking out for me or whatever. They have a back and forth there that, yeah. like you said, is on this sort of like sibling rivalry level where you know, I'm not, yeah. I don't, not your best friend, but I respect you, you know, sort yeah. of thing. And then something else I love, as soon as Hunter goes through the ice, Batcher takes off towards Crosshair. And then Crosshair says, we'll track your movements through the ice to the beacon. We will do that. Mm. Like, me and Batcher. Huh. And from that point on, Batcher is like Crosshair's little sidekick there. And they get to the end, and Crosshair's like, we're going to try to break through the ice. We, again, which I love. And then Hunter says, 
try? And Crosshair's like, I'm glad you heard me correctly. Th- that's what right? I was trying to refer to there. That, that <laughs> I love there. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then Crosshair pulls him up with the blaster and they get past the barrier. And there's just a moment there with, with Crosshair, Batcher, and Hunter sitting in the snow. They give each other a look. No, no dialogue is given back and forth there. Crosshair kind of smiles as Batcher comes up to him and he starts petting Batcher, which again is a very loving moment. There's something completely changes in his face. I don't know how the animators do it, but his face, Crosshair's face completely changes from this hard grizzled grump to this loving, like relieved. Again, like I think the main thing of this episode was relief. There's just something so great about that scene that's bringing them back together as a family and it's all loving. There's, it's just a very loving moment as they're sitting there in the snow without the doom of the monster surrounding them. Nothing needs to be said. I also love yeah. that Batcher runs up to the kind of line of demarcation there and, and it's just the the dog. But yeah. it, in yeah, my you head... better it, run. Yeah. <laughs> and stay out! It's kind of what <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, yeah. hearing in my head. Yeah. You yeah, better Batcher run. Is a, <laughs> Batcher is a great addition to this. When they land on the planet, Batcher's the first out of the ship. Who would have thought? Wagging her tail. It's so good. And that's when Echo says, you know, see, I told you they'd work it out. I don't even see blood this time. So that's progress, which is a great thing to say to Omega. I think it's also a really great thing to say to the audience. Like, again, they've been through worse. And the way they've resolved it in the past, there's been blood involved. (laughs) So this is better than that. So that also like gave me some amount of relief of being like, okay, we don't have to like dedicate any more time to this. This can be done now. And then Crosshair and Hunter have the conversation as they're getting ready to leave of Crosshair saying, I've made mistakes. I thought I knew what I was getting into with the Empire. I thought I was being a good soldier. And Hunter kind of saying, I know, man, I get it, right? That's what I took away from Hunter. Like, I've made mistakes too. I have regrets too. You know, I get it. All we can do is keep moving forward, which is apart from being like a Disney slogan, Whenever a character says that, I get chills. I mean, it just gives me such a good feeling. Like the idea of all we can do is just like keep getting better or keep moving forward. And then Hunter says, there might just be hope for us yet, which is exactly what Anakin says to Ahsoka in the World Between World episodes of Ahsoka, which I just think is a great little poetry moment. Apart from being very meaningful in this moment, I think is a wonderful little poetry moment between these two. I mean, these two redemption stories that we're getting from both of these things, right? Redemption for Ahsoka thinking that she needs redemption and redemption for Anakin and redemption for Crosshair. This has become the line used for redemption. There just might be hope for us yet. You're selling me on this scene, but they should have hugged a little bit there or held (laughs) hands as they walked back into the ship. Hunter leaves Crosshair there alone And he stares back up at the circling hawk. And there might be hope for us yet. We we don't get the the John Williams swell into the ending where like, okay, there is hope here. They give us this kind of somber melody. It does swell in, but it's, it's kind of this more somber tone. I wish we got a little bit more of an upbeat, positive vibe at the end. It's still kind of ambiguous. But you're selling me... I don't even really like that episode of Ahsoka as much as some of the others, but <laughs> I, I love the poetry there. And, and like you're saying, the, the, the parallel with Crosshair and Anakin, you know, two characters that you could be pretty conflicted about. I definitely agree with you. Like, I wish the music was a little bit more upbeat. I do think it's, it's kind of saying, we've made some progress here, but we're not out of the woods yet. It's kind of like, don't get used to this. If we gave you the hard swelling moment right here and then took it away later, we might be more mad. But this is why we can't have nice things. It's not going to last. Yeah. It's not an episode of The Simpsons where we reset the canon at the end of every episode. This is still very much in the Bad Batch style guide. The episodes, I mean, if we wanted to to recap every ending, I would guess there are more of these uh uh-oh endings than happy. (laughs) So (laughs) Uh uh-oh ending. I appreciate them being like, don't get too comfortable because next week, Hemlock. We didn't see them being followed here at all. And in fact, like, not to get too much into Speculation Station, but like, who knows what happened on Pavu while they were away? Something bad could happen. I, uh, I'm i thinking the same thing. They come back and it's an ambush and we've been tracking yeah. your data pad because you got you've turned it on, dum-dums. Yep. <laughs> who knows? But 
10 out of 10 from me. Honestly, this season so far, you what would you rate it out of 10? I loved the Outpost episode last season. And I, I would have loved if they just called this Outpost Part 2. They work so well together. I'm now, I'm a canon of file. I'm an animation of file. I can't give it 10 out of 10 because I need, I'll give it a 9, 9.5. But I, I need the resolution at the mm. end <laughs> to feel a little okay. bit better. But it's, it's too be early. Sorry. It's, it's too early. Yeah. I think in conclusion, Crosshair's redemption is better than Vader's redemption. Hard stop, period, end of sentence. Come at me. Well, it's not over yet. It's going to even get better and better, right? Yeah. I guess technically Vader's isn't over either. Mm. But the on leading up to Vader's, leading up to that moment in uh, Return of the Jedi, leading up to Crosshair's redemption so far, what were actually the sacrifices that we're actually seeing him make is very meaningful. And so I think makes it a more meaningful redemption in my eyes. Right. So there. And we've we've gotten to see it in this serialized format and not with I movies. I love serials. And imagine if this was Bad Batch, you know, the movie or whatever. And we didn't, we don't have all this extended time in between the stories. We're seeing so much linear progress. And it's really satisfying that you get to know the characters so well, which is just the beauty of the format we're watching this in. And we're filling in a lot of those gaps, obviously, with Ahsoka uh, for Anakin's story. So I'm here for it. Keep it coming. All right, listeners, let's keep this conversation going. We would love to hear from you. Leave your comments if you're here on YouTube and make sure to subscribe so we can get to our 500 subscriber mark. Be part of our 500 subscriber club. We'd love to have you back for future episodes because we're going to be talking Bad Batch for the next nine. We got the episode wrong last time. Episodes? So let's not put a number on it. We've got <laughs> lots more Bad Batch episodes coming up. You can also hit us up wherever you like to social media. Thank you for listening to the show today. I've been Royce. I've been Mayday. And we've been Krypton, Krypton to Barton 4. four.